be happy today Gonna pack my cousin a whistle Gonna blow them all away What if I be unlucky Really I ain't got a thing There's a time I always feel happy As happy as a king When the red, red robin comes Just a quick heads up, but in the build-up to this podcast, Phil experienced a few technical problems which meant we had to record over the phone, which has obviously affected the sound quality. Stick with it though, as Phil is a great guy and he is a really interesting listen. Hello and welcome to the Red Robin Heritage Cast, which is powered by 360 Chartered Accountants and Budget Ties Auto Centre. For this episode, I am joined by a man who made 254 appearances and scored over 300 points for the Robins. A fast, powerful runner and a fine cover tackler who always gave 100% for red and white. And a man who made nine appearances for Great Britain and lined up in a World Cup final with Rovers greats Roger Millwood and Lang Casey. Introducing Mr Phil Hogan. Phil, it's a tremendous honour to be able to speak to you about your career in rugby and in particular your time in East Hull. But first of all, just give us a quick update on how you are and what you're up to at the moment. Um, I'm sort of semi-retired. Um, I'm just doing a little bit of physiotherapy now. Um, uh, local clients, family and friends, things like that. But I'm uh, at 68. It's, uh, it's time to put my feet up. Just walk the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say you're retired, but walking the dog's no uh, easy feat, is it? Sometimes they end up no. walking you. Yeah. Well, he's a big unit. He's 88 pounds. Wow. Yeah, big Labrador, but he's massive. Um, I think my um, my ex-partner overfed him when he was a pup. <laughs> <laughs> God love her, she's not with us anymore. She died seven years ago. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a memory for me, keeping him. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, Phil, it's um, uh, a fantastic privilege to be able to speak to you about your time with the Robins. And if we go back to, to 1978 when you signed for us a, a world record transfer fee, £32,000 from Barrow. Mm, um, I just touched you there, it was 35000 Oh, was it? Eight right. Pounds, even more then. Well, the, 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 the story was David Wilkish and Colin Hutton had a cheque for thirty two grand. And they've taken me out to a pub up the, up the road called the White House. And I was telling them that they tried to talk me out of coming off the transfer list the night before, the barrel of chairman. And they looked at one another as if to say, oops, we might not have enough money. Anyway, they'd been in a, a, a meeting with them for about an hour, and they come and got me, I, I was sat in the back of the White Rolls Royce. And um, he said... We want to know whether you want to be a whole KR player or not. I said, well, of course I do. You know, it's a chance of a lifetime for me to play with Roger over in Hull. And um, there was that many players I've I've been uh, friends with. John Cunningham I've been at school with. So um, I went in with him and uh, Colin up and ripped this check up in front of the Barra chairman. David Wilkie put his hand in his pocket, pulled out his own private checkbook, and wrote out a cheque for 35000 right in front of me. And handed it over to him. He said, now you're a whole KR player. Come on, let's get out of this place. Wow. <laughs> and that was what, after, was that after what, 150 appearances at Barrow? Yeah, um, just over that, 157, I think, or something like that. A bit of an odd number, but yeah. Well, I'd had um, I'd had quite the baptism at, at playing at Barrow. I'd had a broken jaw, a broken cheekbone, a uh, dislocated shoulder, all in the space of about nine months. Um, teams were coming to Barrow and sort of targeting me. Two or three players hitting you, you know, uh, one hitting you low, one hitting you at the ball, the other one coming in over the top. And, um, I, I, well you're not going to have a very good long career if those things are happening to you every week. Um, so, um, 
because of a uh, a little money situation with Barrow uh, banning me from my own social club uh, because of my ex-wife and the the DJ uh, called her name and so she slapped his face. So they oh. said, so we're going to ban you from going in. We don't want you hitting him, uh, taking <laughs> it out. And I said, but it's my own place. <laughs> You know, so they, and with the money situation, they would, they would withheld the payment for when I played for Great Britain. So there was arguments all the time, being treated very poorly by Barrow. So, um, in the end, I got fed up and I asked for a transfer. I wanted, I wanted to uh, A, further my career a little bit better, and uh, secondly, get to a club where you looked after better, treated nicer, um, professionally. I, as I've got used to with being in camp with Great Britain and England. Yeah. Tell us about that, Phil, especially the, the World Cup final. Um, obviously, you lost 13 12, but you got to play with Len Casey, Roger Millwood, uh, like you've already mentioned, then great for the game. It must have been a fantastic experience for you to go over uh, well, down under and, and play there. Well, yeah, but you see, this all happened to me as a, as a youngster. I was only 21. Um, and I've never played um, in it. Well, we'd, we'd, Barrow had won the, league, the second division, so we'd played at, at quite a high level, and we got to the semi-final of the Fudrick Trophy one year. So we had a good side at Barrow. And um, so it, it was marvellous for me to get selected on that tour, but that even that was a bit of a... Um, a bit of a unknown quantity, because I, I've been advised um, that you might be selected for the Great Britain tour. I thought, oh, well, wonderful. So I was, I was going to the camps and everything, and then I didn't get kicked. Um, I, I can't remember the proper reason behind that. It's, it's probably a bit like, um, I'll pick your lad if you vote for my lad, that type of thing. And um, so... I was at home, um, basically helping my wife at the time, um, sort out the, um, the next evening meal, and there was a knock on the front door. And there was the uh, Reg Parker, the manager, and he said, um, Phil Lowe and uh, Eric Chisnall have dropped out of the tour party. You're in. I went, oh, my crying. Because... Like, you, you only had about a week before we actually got it then. So it was very rushed. And, um, so, that, that, that's, that's pretty much all of it in one nutshell, you know. If it hadn't have been for Phil, Phil Lowe and Eric Chisnall, who were obviously established stars, I'd, I'd never gone. But I ended up going. Me and Peter Smith got called in at the last minute. Yeah, and obviously, you know, you'll know as well, Phil, rugby league, it's all about taking your opportunity when it comes, and you signed for, for Rovers, 1978, you beat uh, Leeds 16-7 in your debut, and you finished the season after making 17 appearances with a, a championship winner's medal. Tell us about your expectations and hope when you came to East Hull, and, and did you feel any pressure with a, a world record transfer fee hanging over you? Well, of course, um... Each, each match is under so much pressure to try and prove to the fans that you were worth that kind of money. Um, however, I found it very, very difficult fitting into the system that Roger was playing at Graven Park. I come from a freelance uh, position. Frank Foster, coach at Barrow, had always said to me, just go out there and play, Phil. He had players like my brother and John Cunningham and these fellas doing certain jobs, but my job was just to follow them and, and uh, take the ball off them as they would, they'd go into the, com the contact area, they'd turn and I'd be in support and break the line. And I'd scored quite a number of tries for Barrow on some very long-range ones, which is obviously, I think, how I got uh, noticed, you know, scoring 80, 90-yard tries as a back rower, it's, it's pretty unheard of. Um... So when I got to Hull KR, Roger pulled me to one side and, and said, this is how I want you to play. 
And I thought, well, that was quite strange, but I tried my best. But it wasn't working. Um, and so, um, at the end of that season, I sat down with Roger and I said, look, um, obviously you've paid a world record transfer fee for me, and you're, you're, um, you're stifling me, if you, if you get the meaning. You're not allowing me to play my natural game, which is just to follow players. Um, and there was that many big time players at Hull KR at the time. Um, it was difficult to follow, know who to follow. And how to, um, not so much how to take the ball off them or back them up, but how to um, slot into a pattern that works for me. Um, eventually, um, I went back into the centre. I don't know if you remember uh, playing in the centre for a season, but um, and then um, I, I started to find my feet a bit better with, with the team, and hopefully I uh, repaired. I repaid the uh, faith in uh, Colin Upton and Wilkie paying all that money and the club paying all that money for me. And was it a big change, Phil, moving over from Barrow to, to East Hull? Well, very much so. Obviously, I went on tour and I was trying to buy a house. And uh, I gave Max Gold a uh, power of attorney for me. And uh, eventually, they got me a house on uh, Garden Village, Laburnum Avenue. Um, and also, I didn't drive in them days. I do now, but I didn't drive in them days. So getting to and from the ground was always a bit of a labour of love. And um, missed family and friends as well. So, you know, um, the, the bedding in course has took a little bit longer than perhaps... Um, the fans would expect. They'd expect me to come and justify that 35,000 price tag and uh, set the place on the light. But I'd, I'd, I'd struggled to uh, to fit into the... See, Barrow... It's hard to explain. Barrow didn't have any strings on me. They just let me play how I sort of saw the game unfold. Do, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, then, and then getting to Hull KR, they had a rigid pattern and it was called um, Rap. And uh, what he wanted was Roger and the coaching staff was to wrap a certain position, take the ball one way and drag their team across and there'd be someone saying, we, we need another one. And sometimes there was another one. And it would all be going one way, say, wrapped, wrapped to the right, just for argument's sake, towards the touchline. That drags the defence across, and then you want a quick hand coming back. So, I, very often, it leaves me back to be the, the forward, hitting the line on the, on the way back, the quick hand's coming back. Is, yeah? Yeah. Did you, get, did you get that? Yeah, yeah, but to, yeah. To, so to, to try and get the discipline and um, formulas in, in my head when I was used to just freelancing. Even Great Britain just let me freelance. And uh, England, we just want you running, Phil. You know, you're the, you're the fastest forward in the world. We want you running. Just gallop. Run into space, you know. So... To have to um, play to a formula, I found very difficult. I got there in the end, but it, it was it took me a few years. Yeah, and despite yeah. that adversity, Phil, it must have been a tremendous relief for you to end up with a championship winners medal. Oh, fantastic! Well, people who come into the house now, they look in the cabinet and they think, "Oh my, did he have? Well, what you he's won everything, and they see all the caps and the badges and and uh, the winners medals and things, and the, um, even some of the runners up medals, which obviously John Player trophy uh, runners up and uh, and the like. Um, what <laughs> the only um, I'll I'll tell you now. I've, I've discussed this with my daughter. Um, 
My daughter um, hasn't got any children, and uh, she can't have any. Um, so eventually, uh, when I pass, she'll get uh, my display cabinet and all the different uh, medals and trophies that are in it, and um, we're going to uh, decrease it to the uh, museum at Hull KR, the play, uh, past players, because um, there'd be no one to leave it to. Mm. Not having any grandchildren or anything, you know. Well, that's fantastic. So that is that's a that's a real privilege for the club to be able to to be able to, to look after and cherish the mementos of you know some fabulous occasions. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah very, I'm very proud of the collection. It's it's a stunning work of collection, and it all starts with um, well, many many one of the one of the other reasons I left Barrow when I. When you play a hundred games, you're supposed to get a badge, a, a, a blazer badge. And I said, I'm playing for England and Great Britain, touring and going into camp at Leeds and at Warrington and Wigan and so on and so forth. And they've all got their blazer badges on. I said, I haven't got my blazer badge yet. You know, and I've played 150 odd games. Isn't it time I got a badge? Well, in my wage packet the following week was a badge, but it was a cloth one. I said, I can't put that on a blazer. A cloth badge, then the likes of, just pick a name, you know, um, John Edwards, for example, he's there with his uh, gold braid, blazer badge on. And I was telling Willie Horn, the great Willie Horn, who's Captain Great Britain, and Barrow at Wembley and the like, yeah? Have you heard of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he, is, he had a sports shop in Barrow, not far from where I used to live. So I'd call him, uh, have a coffee with him. And I was telling him this tale, and he just looked, put his head down like that. And then the next week, when I went into 13, he said, have a look in the drawer. There's a present for you. And I opened this envelope, and it was his 1955 Wembley badge. He gave me the, his Wembley badge. And he said, Put that on your blazer and wear it with pride. And you, you're, you're the up and coming young thing now. And it's time that Barrow did the right thing with you. <laughs> and about a fortnight left after that, I, I left Barrow. So I <laughs> kept that. It's in pride and place in my display cabinet. Wow, what a fantastic mentor. What a, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. That yeah. someone got enough of me to um, give me their Wembley badge. Yeah, yeah, tremendous. Well, Phil, you, you followed up your, your championship winner's medal in your second season with a Challenge Cup winner's medal, of course, the famous 10-5 victory over Hull FC, Wembley. probably one of the most memorable yeah. games at the old Wembley Stadium. You replaced Steve Hubbard with, what, just a, a minute to go of the game? Um, he still managed to grace the test, though, and although he was only on the pitch for a relatively short amount of time, it must have still been a, a fantastic uh, occasion, an achievement for yourself. Well, yeah. Um Obviously disappointing. I didn't get more uh, more time on the pitch, uh, but I can understand um, the, the feelings and the and the and the logic of it. He didn't want to change what was a winning team. You know, but even though he was badly hurt, he was determined to stay on. And uh, I did fall out with Johnny Moore a little bit because I said, "Get me on." He said, I can't. Roger's uh, not giving me any signals that he wants to change anything. So I had to just sit, sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. And it, it, was, uh, it was quite hard to take, but obviously um, a childhood dream I got there in the end, which uh, I'd never have achieved if I'd have stayed with Bow, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And it must have been, I mean, it's one of the games that goes down in folklore with Carlton Hull. The the, uh, the victory over our bitter rivals, you know, the whole of the city flocking almost to Wembley to, to witness it. How hard is it not to get caught up in the whole emotion of the occasion and just, just focus on the game itself? It all started a week or two before. I'd, I'd pulled Roger over in, in, uh, after a training session and said, um, I'd like to 
put myself forward for a place in the Wembley side. He said, um, the team will be picked on merit on, on the week before. Uh, you are in the squad, but um, the only person guaranteed a place in the side is Clive. And, you know, you can understand that. World Cup winner, 200 games for both Hull and the OKR, you know. So, yeah, he was always going to be um, first on the team sheet. And it was um, slightly disappointing that a few of the players um, were carrying quite... Um, I was fit. I didn't have any injuries. But there was a few of the players that were. Um, they know who they are. They don't need me to say um, and we, I think we'd have beaten them um, even by a bigger margin if all the players that had just played at Wembley were fully fit. But uh, and, it, and it sort of was hard for me to want to take for a, for a number of years that um, that had been the, the, the way forward for. Um, the Wembley side. In fact, I didn't. I, um, I didn't forgive him for about eighteen months. Wow. You know, because nobody wants to go to Wembley and not get not get on, does it? So I suppose it was a, a, a bit of sweet triumph in a way, Phil. It was, yeah. It, it, even though uh, we uh, we got to Wembley, not actually getting on. Well, I got I got on for ninety seconds, but but it's. It's not. It's not like this. You know, you've been um, part of the the team that's done anything. I had never even tackled anybody or touched the ball. I just ran out to stand where Steve Hubbard was on the right wing. Um, there was a few play the ball, and then the hooper went, and I thought, oh, my God, it's true. <laughs> you know, so. It's like having all your Christmases put together at once and then not getting any presents. <laughs> if, yeah. if, that, if that's the way to do it. Um, How much do you think um, Len Casey's return from Bradford that season played a part in you being, being on the bench for that game? Well, very possibly was the, the main reason. Um, I didn't hold any grudges um, with Len. In fact, we've become very, very, very close friends. He lives in Bournemouth, just up the road. And uh, he comes to visit me every couple of weeks for a massage, for a treatment. And, um, yeah, we've, we've become... Well, we, we were close friends on tour. Uh, me, Eddie Bowman, Pete Smith and Len, the four of us used to hang about together. We were all greenhorns, you know, in that... Um, Great Britain set up and England set up. You know, Eddie was a little bit older with Len, and me and Pete were um, like maybe ten years younger. But uh, they sort of took us under their wing and uh, looked after us. So we were great friends, Len and I. Um, in fact, I started um, trying to. Uh, Follow him, knowing I could get a pass. When when you're the runner, like Phil Law was, when you're a runner, you're only as good as the ball that you get. And sometimes you can get a trap ball and it, you can get hurt, you know. But um, this is why uh, they paid big money for me because I could I could adapt to following um, the likes of David Hall or. Uh, Len Casey, Brian Lockwood to a certain extent, Roy Miller, and get a decent pass, yeah? Harkin was great. He, he could throw that big dummy and then drop me off inside or hit me wide, and I could then get my legs galloping. But the Wembley, uh, I didn't blame Len, one, one I ought to, and, and then I understood about Roger's commitment to winning it for Rovers by not changing that winning formula, by altering the players. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
And, and of course, the following season, Phil, was a, a really big one for the Robins, wasn't it? We saw a number of players depart, either uh, retirement or transferred, I suppose. It was the uh, Bernard Watson leaving the club and, and Steve Hartman moving to um, off half. That really freed up that centre position for yourself, Phil, and it was an opportunity you took with both hands. Well, uh, when you look at the side, and I, I obviously... At the end of the season, that's what I always did. I always tried to reevaluate my season and see whether I saw that there was a left centre spot available with Bernard moving and Steve Hartley leaving. So there was a place in the backs, if you like, and I saw the forward line out and I thought, I'll struggle to get into that as a back rower. I'm better off putting my hand up to Roger and saying, I want a shot in the centre, which I did. And he said, oh, right, OK. Are you sure that's what you want to do? And I said, yes. Yeah. But I'll have to put my spikes on and try and get a bit of pace back. Because, obviously, I'd gone a little heavier. I'd built up a little bit more muscle to cope with being in the back row, particularly in the first division, Super League, as, as it would be nowadays. Um, there were some big, big forwards. And um, I was probably around 14, 10, maybe 15 strong. I knew I needed another stone to cope with the demands, which I'd done the, the previous year. So I'd spent the summer with his spikes on, uh, doing sprint training and trying to trim the body down a little bit so that I, I had less body fat and I was a bit quicker. And it, it, it seemed to work. I had quite a number of tries that year, I think, 18 before Christmas or something. And it was your goal kicking as well. Uh, Steve Hubbard missing the start of the season. I think you got 30, uh, 37 goals from 13 games, Phil. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a tremendous return. Yeah, no. I, I, I was on the kicker at Barrow, you see. Um, and um, so, very often, um, training nights, you'd always grab a ball and uh, have a little practice. I used to practice with Hubbard, funnily enough. We'd kick, we'd kick to one another. As we, as though we were the post, would just kick as though we was uh, kicking towards one another, and he just get the muscles built up in the leg so that you can hit the ball well. Yeah, and so I, I knew what I was doing. Um, the, the unfortunate thing was um, the way, in, uh, particularly in the derby game against Hull, when I got six, I kicked six, I think, and it was the way he threw the ball to Hubbard. Um, Steve took over the goal kicks and he never even said anything to me and I looked at him as if to say that's not nice that, that you could have come over and said something and he uh, I never kicked again that was, was that, that was, the feature of the Rovers side so that was maybe a, maybe a bit different to Barrow there's a bit more of a rueful, ruefulness there and there's oh um, yeah it was, it, well it was more professional Um and there was definitely the, uh, the the roles that we all had to fit in. Whereas Farrell, it was like playing for Mass Hornets, you know, on the local rugby side, all the pioneers. Um, so, yes, it, it, there was, the minute I walked into the Craven Park at uh, Hull, um, and this was my spot, there's your tracksuit, your kit. Whereas, Barrow, you have to get a chitty and take it to Willie Arms and buy your boots and put so much to and things like that. But not, there was none of that. So, yes, there was the professionalism that brought to the game, which was the right way to do it, of course, in my opinion. You have to run a, uh, a proper professional shop if you're going to run one. And that, that's everything from the kit man right through to the physios and the doctors and so on who were all looking after you. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And Phil, I suppose a lot of our younger uh, listeners who, who tune into the podcast sometimes forget that, um, you know, our Rovers were performing so well on the pitch and, and Challenge Cup finals, premierships, etc., etc. A lot of the lads were still working. Um, what, what were you doing at this time, Phil? Well, it, I started off um, working at Elverington's, uh, maintenance engineer. 
then I had a short spell at uh, BP down at Salt End. I was working for a, a firm building the acetic acid plant. Uh, I was a mechy fitter by trade. Um, but it, unfortunately, in those days, last in is always first out. So I kept getting laid off. Anyway, I went to the board in the end, and they said, well, how, how do you fancy, we know you're into the gym side of things, how do you fancy running our gym to the public? So I used, that's what I did. I ran the, the health club at, at the ground to the general public for a number of years. Um, so, yeah, you long long days. You're opening at 8 in the morning, and um, you're still there at 10 at night. You know, it was, uh, it was tough. Tough crap. And in between that, six o'clock, you uh, get yourself kitted up to, to go training with the team. And then after training, you're going back to lock up the gym. You know, tidy up and lock it all up. And then obviously, I, I ended up with my own bogey gym. Yeah, the much renowned. And I, I suppose I know it's a different era, Phil, but it seems almost incredible, doesn't it, that. Uh, a club would commit so much money to, to bringing you over from Barrow, a world record fan, say, and then you'd, you'd be, as well as training and playing, you'd then have to uh, get a job as well to, to <laughs> fill your time well, there. It's crazy. We, everybody had to. It wasn't just me. Um, when George Fairman came over, he, he was working. Um, Steve Hubbard was uh, working in the cement uh, business selling, as a, as a trader, selling cement. Um, Ian Robinson, he, he was working full-time. I think he did a little bit of work for Northern Divers. Um, contracting. Um, yeah, so everybody worked. Um, John Millington, one of the uh, toughest players I've ever seen. He, he, put, he used to put 10-hour shifts in, digging on the roads, and then come into Rovers to train for two hours, two and a half hours. I think I think that we were fitter in those days when we were doing, particularly when they introduced the heavy hands, one of the training techniques he'd come back from Chicago with. He went to Chicago after the 81 game, when we got beat by Widness. He went to Chicago, and he came back with uh, quite a number of training techniques using the multi-gyms and the weights in circuits, as well as you're doing sprint training and interval running. And this was unheard of uh, in the very, very early 80s, the interval running, the sprint training, and the gym work. And then when we were doing the interval running, he introduced heavy hands. And that's where you run with a dumbbell in your hand. Not a very heavy one, it'd be only three or four pounds or something like that. But believe me, after 20 minutes of doing a five mile run, your, your shoulders are falling off. <laughs> but we had team meetings and Len used to drive these team meetings and say, listen, we're super fit, we're fitter than any other team in the league, let's just tackle them, give them the ball, let's just tackle them and batter them for an hour. And then Last 20 minutes, we'll just pull the ball about. They'll be on the left. They'll be on the... I nearly swore there. <laughs> they'll, be on the, they'll be on the last legs. And, and it was right. We, we'd run in 20, 30, 40 points in the last 10 minutes. Particularly Steve Hartley, uh, Gary Clark, uh, Clive, God love him. Um, there's a little bit of a... Uh, there was another, Peter Muscroft was on my wing, he scored a lot of tries one season. But yes, yeah, that was, that was our, that wasn't anything to do with Roger, that was us. Uh, the team, have team meetings, yeah? And we'd go into these team meetings and we'd talk about the other side, particularly Hull, and, um they had a fantastic, uh, three quarter line in Hull, um Topo, then they had Lulawai, Kemble, uh, Dan O'Hara, and so we were quite wary of, uh, getting the ball to them. And so one, one day I suggested trying 
to Umbrella, the, the line, always kept a flat line and would go up. But I said, if I go up a little bit faster and get into their defensive line, or their attacking line as a defender, we can stop the ball, we can stop Topo getting the ball out to Lulu I and Dane O'Hara and Gary Campbell, so that he has to go back inside to where Watkins, Millo, Roy Allstock, Phil Lowe, Paul Rose, Len Casey are waiting. So we, 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 that's what we tried. We tried it one, one day, and it worked a treat. So that was another way of uh, using that little bit of extra pace just to get up into their line. And, and um, these are the things I remember vividly about how we uh, would talk about how to beat opposition. And Phil, I mean, you've already spoke about how incredibly tough you had to be to play and how, how fit you had to be, play. You had, that season you played 41 games. It featured a, a Yorkshire Cup final loss to Leeds. Uh, of course, the second appearance at Wembley, a Challenge Cup final defeat to Witness. And then we ended the season with a Premiership Trophy final victory over Hull again. You scored three tries in. Um, a tremendous season, really, isn't it, when you consider how many games were played and... and at least we got to taste victory at the end of it, but to feature in three three finals is incredible. Yeah, well, this, that that was the precursor for the for the next year. We we sat down and we learned a little bit about ourselves, um, having a little bit more discipline in defence. And the following year, I think, is when we did a uh, we, we did the treble. I think. Um, I think we missed out on Wembley was the only thing we missed out on. But we won everything else. And um learning curve, isn't it? We all have to do go on one. And yeah, I'm just slightly you'd have to you'd have to jog my memory a, a little bit about it, but uh, yeah. Sorry. It must just have been tremendous. Uh, Phil, I mean, you're playing rugby league, you're playing at the, the top level of sport, you're pl- regularly featuring in finals, you know, to, to for someone who's obviously come from Baron and not really had the opportunity to taste too much success and then to be uh, coming to Rovers and being able to play in these games, it must have been another fantastic justification for you for, for making that move in the first place. Um, well, yeah, but I think a lot of people forget that I played for... England and Great Britain from Barrow, which was a second division team, which was, it, it's unheard of now, but um, I remember um, Frank Foster came to see me one, one it was it was the match, and he, he pulled me to one side before the game, and he said, all the selectors are here today, they're here to watch Norton, and we were playing Cat in the Fuddley Trophy, and um, he said, Go and show them what you've got. And I went, I thought, oh, right, okay. And Colin Tyra took a kick from the halfway line to start the match. I jumped up, caught it, one-handed, landed in space, suddenly ran to the fullback, and Glyn Davis was uh, backing me up, and I just popped it up to Glyn Davis, and he scored under the six. At the time, it was one of the fastest tries ever scored. And, and, I, I, I sometimes think the fans just wondered where I'd come from. But I'd had, a, I'd had an eight-year career with Barrow. I suppose from that's the, the thing as well, Phil. I mean, everything from social media, the media, everything, everyone's so well-known. I suppose back then, the game probably didn't... Well, it definitely didn't enjoy as much coverage as it does now. No, um, it didn't. And, and um, you only ever got... In, in uh, the press, you only got, ever got five or six lines, you know. Say, for example, that match. Barrow beat Cass in a shot defeat. That was probably it. There was no big uh, synopsis of the game or people's opinions and things like that. It was just... And, and that's always been a bit of a... Uh, I would just wish that the people that were running our game would um, try and influence the media a little bit more, the television people, the the press people, uh, and and try and get a bit more coverage out there because people want that. People are interested. They want to read uh, how they get. They can't maybe afford to get to the game. I can't go 
I'd love to come and travel to Hull and, and see a few games. I do come over a couple of times a year, but the expense is, is, is phenomenal. So other people must be feeling that. So sometimes I like to sit and read the reports. And in, in those days, back in the 70s, I signed professional uh, 1970. Not, not, a people, not a lot of people know that. Well, 4th of June, 1970. Yeah. And that's, and that's the beauty of why we do these podcasts, uh, Phil, because we want to bring uh, stories out that people don't know. And I suppose one of the most famous games that you featured in was the 82-83 the season. You played 36 games that season. Your versatility, once again, coming to the fore. You played 10 to second row, lose forward. Uh, the season finished with a friendship trim. Uh, trophy semi-final defeat to Widness, but a lot of people remember that season, the the Bradford game, the first round, I think, of the, was it the uh, the, the Premiership uh, yeah, season, the and the yeah. famous walk-off, uh, Captain yeah, sure. Grayson, yeah. obviously he, he threw the ball at the referee, Robin Whitfield, um, and then after that, the, the game was over. Yeah, I remember that game, and um, we had to sit down, basically, on the pitch. Because they'd walked off, and if we'd have walked off, the game would have uh, been abandoned. But we were told that we had to stay on the pitch. If we stayed on the pitch for, say, another few minutes, I can't remember the, the exact details, we could claim the point. And so <laughs> we just sat down on the pitch, looking at one another as a... Is this is this really happening, or is Monty Python going to come out and start <laughs> having a laugh with us? You know, Jeremy Beadle. But yeah, it was strange, strange that um, things that happened to a professional sports team. I'm trying to think. I can't remember any any other circumstances where where that's happened in never mind rugby league, any other sport. It's such a, an incredible, well, I suppose <laughs> partial circumstances. The only other thing I can think that was very similar was we were, I, I don't know if you remember, we, we played Taff at Taff, and um, we got a penalty at the halfway line, and um, I was asked, do you think you can kick it? I said, yeah, I can kick from the halfway. So I set the ball up, kicked it, and then the floodlights went. <laughs> and we had to go off. And we were sat in the changing rooms for about 20 minutes while they were getting the lights back on. And when I came back out, or when we all came back out, they said, because the floodlights went, as the ball was in the air, we don't know whether it went through the sticks or not, you'll have to check it again. I mean, who would have thought of that? Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. And did you get, did you get it again? I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Phil, yeah. you had a fantastic record in your first, what, four and a half seasons at Rovers, 164 appearances. I suppose the following two seasons, 83, 84, and then 84, 85, you started to suffer a few minor injuries. What, do you think it was just because you played so many games in maybe such a short space of time that it started to catch up with you? Uh, no, um, there was a medical reason. Um, not many people will know this either. Um, I, I um, had osteoarthritis of the ankles, um, and, and they reckoned it was because I'd been hospitalised as a teenager, or actually I wasn't even a teenager, I was at primary school, so I'd fallen in a fire and I'd been burnt badly, um, and I spent many, many months laid up in bed uh, in a hospital just outside Barrow, under, under um, a tent-like thing, and every day they'd come and spray plastic skin on me, and... Um, they think it was because I had a growth spurt while I was in the hospital and it affected my ankles because I wasn't doing any standing. I had to stay, lay, you know, stay laid down. So I was diagnosed with this osteoarthritis and um, it was very prevalent when we were doing the, the road runs. Roger had the um, designated road runs uh, um, Brand Zone School, um, the Golf Club, etc., uh, etc. Et and so you'd, you'd just say uh, Golf Club and Bat Lads. And we'd all look at one another as if so. Road running, 
And we didn't have specialist trainers in those days. You just had Woolies pumps. You know, uh, it, it's hard to explain nowadays as these modern trainers, they save, your le- they save your legs and your back and your knees, but we were just running in Woolies pumps. And this condition, osteoarthritis, flared up. So they stuck me on a, um, an anti-inflammatory called naproxen or naprosan. And I brought my thumb. I brought my hand. And I brought my arm. All in consecutive matches. And so the, the club, rightly, sent me for a DEXA scan. And the, it diagnosed me with, with a mild form of osteoporosis. And I said, oh, crikey, how can you have osteoporosis playing contact sport? So, um, I had to come off the anti-inflammatories and then go on um, all sorts of calcium tablets and yoghurt um, and a, a, a product called Nickbone. I can't, I can't remember its generic name. That was just its nickname, Nickbone. And you have to crush it in the pestle and mortar but it was the most foul-tasting thing you've ever had in your life. So I had to mix it in into a, uh, like a banana yoghurt flavour summer and take it that way. And um, I went back for a DEXA scan after three months and the, um, it had corrected a bit of the bone damage. And uh, for, for, say, a back row player, uh, to be playing with a mild form of osteoporosis is, is horrible. So... Um, I had to take uh, protective measures. Yeah, so thankfully I'm I'm well and fit and don't have any of those issues anymore. Yeah, it's such a shame. Um, but obviously the following two seasons that you already mentioned, so you suffer a number of injuries. I mean, obviously you've had a, a big issue there. Um, and of course that led to you missing out on the 1984 Premiership final. Although you did play in the 1985 John Player Trophy victory overall, you scored oh. and created a try for your good friend Gary Clark. But I suppose so. That was only half the story, wasn't it, of having that game? Well, <laughs> I was in bed. I was in bed and my wife came in and said, uh, Roger's on the phone. Oh, right. And the phone in them days was downstairs in the hall. So I threw my pants on, went downstairs, picked the phone up. And he said, um, are you fit? I said, well, yeah, I run a health club, Roger. I'm always fit. I keep, I look after myself regularly. He said, well, get yourself to the therapy hotel. Um, Andy Kelly's broken his ankle or leg. Um, and uh, we need a back row. I said, I've got a broken arm. I'm in a cast. He said, get yourself here now. He said, well, let the physios and the doctors have a look at you and see if you can play. I said, I've got a broken arm. I'm in a plaster cast. He said, I don't give a shit. Get here. So I got a Stanley knife and cut the plaster cast off, phoned the taxi, got to the therapy hotel, and um, this was a uh, heavily guarded secret. They took me outside with Mike Smith, Kitted me up with all the kit. Right, see if you can tackle Mike. Uh, see if it feels all right. And I sort of took a deep breath and he come running at me half-hearted, you know, as, as you do in training. And uh, I tackled him and, and they said, well, what do you think? I said, well, it felt all right. There you go. Right. So I thought they'd put me on the bench and put me on for the last five minutes or something like that. But no, they started me. And I'm going, I'm, I haven't trained for three months. I'm, I can't run around for 80 minutes, you know, I haven't, bloody hell, <laughs> it's quite a thing. But only Roger and Colin Upton and Mike Smith were in, knew about it. But the rest is history. I, I swore I'd never tell because if that had leaked out to the press or Hull FC or somebody like that, that they were playing, Hull KR were playing a player with a broken arm that's just had his plaster cast taken off. Anyway, on the Monday, I had to go back to uh, Hull Royal and have a new cast fitted. And the, and the woman said, 
foot all and gravy's on your elbows and because it was snowing, uh, it, it, it was like you got um, ice burns all over your elbows and knees. And she said, how have you got all them straight? Oh, I said, um, it's probably just me. I was washing my arm in the shower. And <laughs> anyway, um, the, the rest is history, obviously. But I played that game. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't trained with a team or anything for three months. I think what's remarkable about it as well, Bill, is not only you actually played, you, you're one of the best players on the pitch. You know, and <laughs> so, never mind your, your injury, but your fitness levels must have been a bit lower. What, what do you think just got you through that game? Because not only <laughs> physically would you sort of never your feet off, but the conditions <laughs> were terrible. Well, yeah, I mean, um, it was just an adrenaline rush, to be totally honest with you. I, I'm, I'm, my stomach was doing triple backflips, uh, thinking, how am I going to play this game now? Um, never mind, um, obviously I'd exercised, uh, but only one-armed. So even, even I used to have a, a punch bag in the gym. I, even, I'd just stand there and hit it with one hand. <laughs> just a, a bit of a workout. But not running properly and not, not doing any... Uh, cardio at all for the three months I, I just went into a massive adrenaline rush um, thinking I didn't want to let the lads down I didn't want to let Roger down particularly um, and this was the one trophy that eluded me I'd love to win it you know um, having played in one a, a year or two earlier and, and getting the, the losers medal was, wasn't easy to take so uh, I went out and just thought, try and you know, you know when you're you're um, conditioned to do certain things. Yeah. I just I, I just let myself go into um, automatic um, automatic mode. Just try and do everything that you know is the right thing to do. You know, tackling. Backing up, running, trying to make yardage, good yardage for the team, etc., etc., and it and it sort of just works works for me. Did you suffer any long term impact or injuries after that game against Hull? Phil? No, all, only the grass ice burns. We <laughs> we all went out for a meal uh, that night, and when you sat down, um, all the all the little cuts on your knees. Uh, would leak and they'd stick to your pants and the pants would rip the door and the, you, know, you would be <sighs> but um, you, you took that it was part and parcel of it playing in the snow <laughs> yeah. and I, and I, suppose, I suppose Phil I mean maybe not the circumstances that you got to play in that game but when you look back at your rugby league career these are the games that you wanted to play in you know 25,000 that at Bulfrey Park, a, a big city derby. Th- this is what, I suppose, playing rugby league and, and, and playing these big games is all about. Well, of course. Um, everybody wants to play in in finals or um, in test matches or uh, internationals because that is why you, you start playing the game in the first place. You probably see people on the... You know, like when I was a boy, uh, my first game of rugby league that I ever went to was to watch Keith Jarrett. Barrow had paid a world record transfer fee for Keith Jarrett, and this guy was awesome. And I thought, that's just what I want to be. That. Kicking goals, scoring size, running like the wind. And I, w- I, I, I was at home one day. I was only 15 years old, the knock on the door, answered the door, two chaps in suits. Never seen them before. Is your dad in? Yeah, dad. So I got me dad. Were you to sign your son? He's already signed. My older brother, Steve. No, him. Phil. He's only 15. Well, we'll sign him on amateur forms, and then when he's 16, he can get his payment. So that's what happened. And it was like, God, I'm going to be a professional rugby player. And... 
it, 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 it's just a whirlwind romance with the game ever since. I never finished playing until I was 56. Wow. And then we're talking about the big game still. I mean, the following season, you defeated Castleford in the final of the Yorkshire Cup. Um, although injury meant you missed out on your third Wembley appearance, you and Chris Burton both rolled out the Chance Cup final. I think it was both uh, yeah, regular both second row. Yeah. And it was a, a huge miss. Uh, you two not being able to play that final. Paul Rovers missed uh, out on missing the trophy. A one one point defeat. John Dorahay famously missing uh, the kiss. Um, a bit of a, a, a bittersweet season, I suppose, for yourself. Yeah, it was, um, I, I was playing some of my best rugby. Um, Paul Harkin used to, and, and George Fairburn used to uh, say, give him a wolf tackle, Ogie. And I said to him, what's a wolf tackle? And he said, every time you hit him, you knock the wind out of him. <laughs> so, it, you know, it just became a, a little bit of a funny thing to say to one another, you know. And, um, unfortunately, um, a week before, we played Wigan away, uh, and I tackled um, Nick Detroit. Uh, Gordon Smith had, was sweeping, and he'd come through their attack, and the ankle tapped, it, tapped him, and he fell head first into me as I was coming up to hit him, and he hit me right across the middle of the radius with his head. I knew straight away it was broke, but I didn't want to sort of say out, I just walked off. And uh, the physios come up, what's up? Broke my arm. How do you know? Well, look. <laughs> <laughs> Don't move it like that. <laughs> you can rupture an artery. Anyway, then. I just had to uh, man up and swallow. And there, was, there wasn't anything I could do about it. It, it. it was one of them things. And this is sport. Um, you can't do anything about things. You, you, you've just sometimes got to man up. And um, take your medicine, get back in the gym on the running track, um, and try and regain your fitness. I, I, I was unfortunate enough that I broke it first game back at Barrow, of all places. They had a big prop, Webb, who fell on me. And I already had my arm out with the ball, and it just... Um, it bent the plate, to be honest. It, it uh, sheared the three pins off that was on, that was uh, at the bottom section of the of the plate. So I had to have it repaired uh, the following day, following week. Um, but like I say, you can't plan for it. You've just got to man up and check it. Yeah, and that following that season and that injury at Barrow, you just put, you played. Just 11 more games for the, the Robin still. Uh, your final appearance coming against Wigan in the third round of the John Player Trophy at Central Park. 7th of December 1988, I'm sure you remember it well. When you look back at your career still at Oakington Rovers, how would you sum it up? Very successful. I just wish uh, the injuries um, um, hadn't have taken so much of a toll on me. However, um, who was to know that the uh, med medicine that they were giving me to control the osteoarthritis in the ankles was causing me this bone deficiency. Um, hence, the fractures. Um, you know, it, it was just something I had to learn to live with. And I had to um, then go and see the pharmacist and say, how can I repair this? Um, this in, uh, extensive damage to my bones I'm playing contact sport how can I and that's how it all came to light that I needed to go on these, uh, this knit bone I can't remember as, as I say the, the real name of it um, calcium tablets and yogurts and I use a pestle and mortar in the morning grind it all up into, into a paste and then put it into a yogurt and then and I was like that for um, maybe three years after after I retired to repair some of the damage that this condition, this disease had caused. No, yeah. I thought it was just 
um, uh, I guess it, you can actually blame it on me for being silly, falling into a fire, a bonfire, and having to have um, plastic skin sprayed on me for three to nine months. Yeah, we've got, you made 254 appearances for Robin, 25 of these as substitute, he scored 65 tries, kicked 53 goals, including a drop goal, a total of 316 points. Um, like we said, you're in an absolute world was great, and I know that many people will be looking forward to hearing your story like your time in red and white. Um, I suppose before we finish though, Phil, one game that I did want to speak to you about, and it's because Rovers have launched a uh, uh, a shirt in tribute to that victory in 1983 against uh, Queensland, the game that you featured in. Um, what were your reflections of that game? Um, losing the contact lenses very early on. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, that, that was the vivid uh, recollection. And I thought, you know, fingers in the eyes. And, it, and it's always been a bit of a pet hate of mine, but Hey, um, I had to just get on with it. Um, I remember Gordon Smith saying, I was checking a kick at goal one year, and he said, uh, are, you, are you lining that up right, Augie? I said, not really, I can't see the post. <laughs> he said, why is that? I said, I've had both lenses taken out. Fingers, fingers in the eyes. And uh, in them days, you, you couldn't really afford to have a, a, a spare set. You know, there were hundreds of pounds. And um, he stood behind me going left a bit, left a bit, right a bit. <laughs> and so there was a funny side to things when you think about when you think back about your career. Um, I don't I don't regret any of it. Um, in fact, I just wish I could have got a little bit better tally um, for playing for Rovers. You know, I'd, I'd have liked for another hundred games. Don't forget, I played 157 or so for Barrow. I mean, total them up, and then the England internationals and Great Britain. You know, it's over 400 games. Yeah, it's a fantastic record. So, fan- what? How old was you then? So, when when you when you left Rovers, how old had you been then, Phil? I was 36. Um, 36. I went. I, I came back to Barrow for their job, um, and I got the Barrow job, and. Um, Started working, and then uh, the then chairman, Mr. Johnson, came to me and he said, We're, uh, We've uh, got you some help. We've got you Steve Norton's coming in to be your assistant. And I went, I don't need an assistant. And Steve Norton, I'm thinking, wow. Anyway, um, three months later, I got a dear John letter off him saying that Norton wants to take over, do it all himself. And I said, well, you better get him fit because they're playing Wigan away in the Lancashire Cup in three months' time. And they got beat 92-0. <laughs> but that meant I was out of the game and yeah. Barrow have done it again to me. Yeah. You know, being uh, um, not very nice. So I was out of the game and... Um, my next door neighbour said, "What? Why aren't you heavily involved with Barrow then?" Told him the scenario, so he said, "Well, we're looking for a physio, and this was my junior club, Furness Rugby Union, way back in the day, in the 60s. I'm talking about when I played for the Colts up there, and um, so I went up there, and I've been a, I've been there ever since, and that was that was how I played in, in the 50s. I played when I was 56." In in a B team game, <laughs> I must be crazy. And I bet when you look at the game now, Phil, I bet you think you could leave your mark on the game. You know, when you look at Super League now and and the quality of the league, I bet you feel like you could you could have made a difference. Well, I, I look at I look at the game now, and there's a shortage of uh, forwards who can do what I can do, or or Phil Law could do, or Paul Rose could do. Or even Len. Len was a great forward at getting the ball out. And um, it, I think that's one of the reasons we got beat by Samoa. We didn't have a big back rows. Um, 
Whitehead did all right. But uh, the other fella, um, was just too light, too small. Couldn't make any impression. And uh, we were in the pub with a few of my friends, um, and we were talking about it. And, and then just one guy said, you need a slogan on there. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm, I, I can't play like that. You know, I never played like that. And they said, no, but you you took, you took you were hard to stop because of your pace and your size. And um, I, I said, well, if you think about that whole KR team, I was the smallest in that pack. You know, you had Milo, Watke, Roy Alscott, Phil Lowe, Paul Rose, myself. And then... Uh, Paul went to Hull, and when Casey came back in, I went up the second row. And then when Gavin Miller came, um, I stayed in the second row, and he stayed at loose forward. But you know, I'd like to, I'd like to think, even though when you talk to the modern day coaches, they say I wouldn't, I wouldn't have coped. I said, why is that? Because of that, and they point to your belly, and I said, I've never had a belly when I played. <laughs> I was eight percent body fat. I was fit as a lot. Needless to say, that's probably why I managed to play the full game in the John Player final and and hadn't trained with the side for three months. Yeah, there you go. Just that overall fitness, Phil, I think we'll see you through it. Well, that, going to work every day, I think, keeps you fit. If you work in an eight and ten hour shift, which is what I was doing at the gym, you know, and you're picking weights up, putting them away, you're cleaning, you're, you're doing all the... the you have a cleaner who comes in and they do everything, get everything ready, but during the day, as and when customers are coming in, you need to keep on top of everything. You know, so it's, it's a constant thing. And this is the thing about um, having a, a core of fitness from just going to your daily work for eight hours or what have you. Never mind being... Uh, a full-time professional, um, I, I could be wrong, and I don't know how they train or what they do for training. But I bet they only I bet they only train for a couple of hours per day. Um, then probably the rest of the time they're, they're evaluating videos and things like that. But if the eight hours with the training. That gives you that core fitness. It's why we play, we could manage 80 minutes as, as quite big players, you know. Uh, well, Phil, I'm sure all the listeners and viewers will agree. It's been another fantastic Red Robin Heritage cast, which is, of course, powered by 360 Chartered Accountants and Budget Size Auto Centre. Please make sure you check them out online or in person. This is Heritage Cast number 21 which means there is another 20 heritage cast for you to listen to, with me speaking to the likes of Justin Morgan, John Dorohey, Dave Hall and Wayne Parker, to name a few. These are available from all the main podcast providers. A huge thanks to Phil Hogan. And for now, please remember to live, love, laugh and be happy. Mm-hmm.